Welcome back. Uh, March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb, right? Wonderful spring weather we got. I'm glad you all made it back, or most of you made it back. We have two screens today, so we're in good shape. I discovered this morning and last night, again, a reminder just how easy it is to waste tremendous amounts of time on the internet. I wanted to tell you this morning that we have a tremendous amount of stuff to cover, lots to do, and not enough time to do it. So I tried to look up where that quote came from. No. All right. So I was going to illustrate the quote very nicely for you, but we don't have that. OK. If we could bring my lights person is gone. Where did John go? Wait for John to come back, and then the lights can go down. Yeah, the main light's down for us to get started here. As the last few people drift in. Lots of That's good. Okay. We'll bring the back, lights back up after this slide so you can stay awake. Right. Let's start with, with this. Again, we do have lots to do today. Uh, so I don't know how far we'll get. We'll see what happens. But let's start with this. This is the Big Dipper. When you look up in the sky and you look at stars and you see stars like this, what can you conclude about those stars just from looking at them? They're beautiful. OK. Besides being beautiful, which they are, what else can we conclude? Let's go to the physics rather than the aesthetics. It's clear. It's a clear night. All right. What else? Bright. Some are brighter. Some are fainter. They don't, move. they don't move. Well, from this picture, you can't conclude that. But if you look at it in enough nights, you conclude that. So that's good. The main thing you can conclude from looking at the stars at night is that indeed some of them are brighter and some of them are fainter. That really doesn't do us much good. We want to know why some of them are brighter and why some of them are fainter. So why are some of them brighter and some fainter? Further away. further away. It's obvious. Which ones are further away, the fainter ones or the brighter ones? The fainter ones. Good. You've used your common sense. And what did we learn about common sense last time? It's not going to help you very much. There is more to this story than your gut tells you about the stars. But for most of human history, the answer you just gave me is the one we all used, that the faint stars are far away, the bright stars are close. And that's obviously right, which ought to tell you that it probably is either wrong or isn't the whole story. <laughs> so what we want to do is figure out what of a star actually is. And in order to do that, we need to look a bit deeper. So our intuition told us Distance determines the brightness of stars. Physics tells us that this story, and what we want to do is figure out, in addition to distance, what else there is that determines the brightness of stars. Ultimately, today, we're trying to put together a plot. We want a single diagram that's called the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, the HR diagram. It is far and away the most important diagram in astronomy and astrophysics. So I want you to understand what you're looking at with the diagram, because that diagram is going to take us to the end of the universe. That diagram is going to take us back to the beginning of the universe. And you need to understand what we're looking at when we look at that diagram. And I want you to be convinced that astronomers know what they're doing when they've created this diagram. That's what we're trying to do today. All right? You told me distance determines the brightness of stars. And indeed, distance does matter. Some other things will matter. But distance certainly matters. And with light, with any source of light, if you take that source of light and take it further away from you, it gets fainter. If you bring it closer to you, it gets brighter. That's what your instinct understands. In physics, we can measure how the brightness of an object changes with distance. And the way in which they change with the brightness of something changes with distance. And something becomes twice as far away. It's not twice 
as faint or half as bright, it's four times fainter. If something is three times further away, it's nine times fainter. If it's 10 times further away, it's 100 times fainter. The inverse square law. The inverse square law appears all over the place in physics. This is how gravity works. This is how electricity and magnetism works. This is how light works. For something that's a little closer to home, quite literally, if you've painted a wall in your house, if you take that can of paint and you have one square of wall that you're going to cover with that can of paint. Use, use up all the paint on that one square meter. You're painting it red. It's now bright red. Now you want to instead use that same can of paint to paint a wall that has four square meters. You're going to have to spread the paint over four times as much surface area, so you can only use one quarter as much paint on the entire wall. The wall is not going to look as bright because the paint is thinner. Now, if you want to use that one can of paint on a whole room that has a thousand square meters of, that's pretty big, thousand square meters of wall, that paint is going to be almost transparent. This is what light does. The further away the light has to go, the more surface of the universe or the sky it has to spread over, so it becomes fainter, the inverse square law. We can quantify this, you don't need the equation. But we can quantify this to figure out exactly how far away an object is if we can measure its brightness. This is a great tool to have. So it's our first law of physics for today, the inverse square law. Yes? Absolutely. What he said was, isn't there another factor involved? Couldn't the emission from the star determine how bright it is? We're getting there. Okay. Again, we use the Home Depot analogy. If I have a 100-watt light bulb and a 15-watt light bulb, and they're the same distance in front of you, obviously the 100-watt light bulb is brighter than the 15-watt light bulb. If I take the 100-watt light bulb and move it away to a greater distance than the 15-watt light bulb, they may look to your eye to be the same brightness. They're intrinsically different brightnesses but they have different distances. So now there are two factors involved in how bright an object looks to you, how close or far away it is, and how intrinsically bright that object is. Now we've gotten ahead, but I think I'll catch up. All right, I've got a pot of spaghetti. You've all heated up the water to cook your spaghetti. What factors determine how easily or when that pot of water will boil? The air pressure. Ah, OK. Um, we're going to forget altitude. We're, we're just going to stay in Nashville. OK? That was very good. OK? What other factors? The amount of heat. OK? The amount of heat going into that pot. The area. The area of the pot. OK? That's good. We, we hit them both. We actually hit all three if we include comparing Denver and Nashville. But temperature and the size of the burner you're going to use determine how readily you can boil that pot of water. We're going to compare this to stars. That's where we're going. Because stars also have temperatures, and stars also have different sizes. What I want to make the case to you for is that we can measure those. And it's astronomers actually know the temperatures and the sizes of stars. Okay. Here we have a stove. I've got four burners. If I set all four burners to the same temperature, which burner are you going to use to get more energy? Bigger one. Okay. Size matters again. The bigger the source of heat is, the more energy you get from that source of heat. If we're comparing two objects that have the same temperature, the big one generates more heat. So you can boil that pot of water on a big burner at a low temperature. It's actually hard to boil that pot of water on a little burner at a high temperature, but you as cooks have learned how to adjust depending on what stove you've got. All right. This leads us to the second law of physics that we need today. It's the Stefan Boltzmann law. The Stefan Boltzmann law says the total amount of energy emitted by an object, how much heat or energy you get from it, depends on the temperature 
and how big it is, the surface area. It turns out that temperature is a much more important effect because quantitatively, the amount of energy you get depends on temperature to the fourth power, which means if I double the temperature, I don't double the amount of heat. I increase the amount of heat by 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 2 to the fourth power, which is 16. So if you turn the temperature up by a factor of 2, you get 16 times more energy from it. That's a very powerful effect. Again, for us in here, we're not going to do the math, but this is a basic law of physics that has been known empirically for almost two centuries. It's very easy to measure the temperature of an object if you know how much energy you get from it and you know how big it is. Or if you know how big it is and the temperature, you can measure how much energy is coming from it. Any two of those three parameters will give you the third one. So now let's go back and see what astronomers actually have done over the last couple of centuries. In the 18th century, astronomers generally concluded that all stars were identical. And the only difference between the stars we saw in the sky is that some stars were closer and some stars were fainter. And the reason some are closer is some are closer. Is that me? The reason some are fainter than others is because some are further away than others. But all stars are were thought to be in there we go. All stars were thought to be intrinsically identical, which means they weren't some of them were not hundred watt light bulbs and others fifteen watt light bulbs. They were all one hundred watt light bulbs. That's what the understanding was in the 18th century. It's not correct. But in about the year 1800, there was no other way to figure out any other differences between the stars. Hey, David, let's swap your mic out. OK. Can you hear me now? Can you still hear me? All right. Now I have to know not to shout. That's hard to do. Can you still hear me? OK. Question came up about the lights. There are a few slides that I really, this is loud. How's that? OK. Well, I think we're good right here. I have a trouble not shouting. Okay. There are a few slides you really need to be able to see well. We'll bring the lights down for those. For most of these, this is just background and some words that reiterate what I'm saying. So I think we're good with the lights on. You'll stay awake better that way. All right, so it's now the year 1800. Astronomers think every star the only difference is some stars are further away than others. And along comes William Herschel. William Herschel was undoubtedly the most important astronomer of the 18th century. He probably also was the most important astronomer of the 19th century. But either way, 600-pound gorilla. He's most famous for having discovered the planet Uranus. But that's not his most important work. His most important work was measuring stars. And he was very interested in a special kind of star that were referred to at the time as double stars. Double stars were stars that just happened to be two stars. Nobody knew anything more about those two stars other than they appeared to be close together. The assumption was that that was just a random coincidence. Stars are randomly distributed in the sky, both left and right, up and down, and in depth, two stars that just were close together. So he studied these double stars. What he found is that some of those double stars were in orbit around each other. 
He could see them move, slowly, but he could see them move, and they went around each other. He gave them a new name. He called these binary stars to refer to two stars that are intrinsically related. They're part of the same system. In the same way that the Earth orbits the Sun, these stars orbit each other. If those stars orbit each other, then you suddenly know a tremendous amount more about those stars because you know they're at the same distance. One isn't further away than the other. They're at the same distance from us. And if you find a pair of stars in orbit around each other, and one is faint and one is bright, what do you know about those two stars? Not necessarily. One's giving you more energy, OK? Good. Well, we don't know young or old yet, but I, I heard there. One is giving us more energy, and there are two factors that we already know that cause a star to give us more energy. One is the temperature, one is the size. We don't know which it is yet. What we do know is that one's bright, one's faint, they're at the same distance, so these two stars have different intrinsic brightnesses. Now we have the 100 watt light bulb and the 25 watt light bulb. Two stars are intrinsically different in brightness. This is a, a really profound discovery. Turn of the 19th century, astronomers have suddenly discovered that all stars are alike. Some stars are brighter than others, not because of distance, but because they have intrinsic properties that make some of them different from others. That's a big change. You watch them today, next year. They don't move quickly. You have to watch them over a period of years. A binary system that's very far away, you're not going to be able to measure this. He got lucky. Some of, the bi some of the double star systems he was looking at were close enough that over a period of several years, he could start to change in position. Uh, in 1800, no photographic plates, <laughs> pen and pencil. And his sister, Caroline Herschel, was his pen and pencil. Okay. She worked with him all the time. She made his drawings. And you make a drawing. You see the two stars are here today. You look at that same field of stars five years later, and the stars are in different positions. And you do it again five years later, and they're in different positions. It requires patience. But, but he had decades, several decades of observations to work with. All right. So we now know that stars have intrinsic differences in how bright they are. So what else can we do? And now we need the lights down again. This is the other slide where we need all the lights down. Main lights, I think. And the other one. There. We go. All right. This is the constellation Orion. What's obvious in this image that tells you stars are not the same? Colors. Colors. Good. So we have the top left, we have Betelgeuse, which is a red star. We call Betelgeuse a red giant. That's 2011 speak because we know it's a big star. In the early 19th century, it was obvious this is a red star. Bottom right is Rigel. Rigel is a blue star, a blue giant star. Most of the other stars are whiter. But it's obvious stars have different colors. William Herschel knew that some stars had different colors. In 1800, that seemed to be slightly different in colors than others. And in fact, those color identifications of stars, again, for only about a half dozen of them, went back 2,000 years. The Greek astronomers knew that a few stars had different colors. They ignored those color differences as not being meaningful. Herschel said the reason these stars have different colors is they're moving in different directions. And it's the motion of the stars that causes them to have different colors. He didn't know anything about what we call Doppler shifts. And we'll get to that eventually, though not today. 
but that wasn't the right answer. Another possible answer is maybe something happens to the light between when the light leaves the star and when it gets to us. The answer would come two decades later. The Russian astronomer von Struve used Herschel's technique of binary stars. And by observing binary stars, he found certain binary stars in which the stars had different colors. And if the stars are different colors and they're in binary systems, we know they're at the same distance from us. We know that whatever happens to the light from one star or the other happens the same way. Stars have different colors because they are intrinsically different in color. So now we know that stars have intrinsically different brightnesses and they have intrinsically different colors. And we're now in the 1820s or so. so now I want to go down a, a different path. We'll come back to her, but it to understand more about stars, we need to understand a lot about light itself. As an astronomer, the only information I get from the stars is light. Someday, astronomers may harness some other stars from the sky. There are things called neutrinos, but neutrino astronomy truly doesn't exist yet. There are gravity waves. Gravity wave astronomy doesn't exist yet. The only kind of astronomy that has ever existed is the measurement of light from objects in the sky. So we need to understand light. We know that light is produced by different kinds of objects in different kinds of ways. What we want to understand is a bit more about it. The stars are far away. The light has to get from the stars to us for us to measure it. So what is light itself? If we want a simple definition of light, it's energy carried through space. We can make the definition a lot more complicated because light behaves differently depending on the environment, the situation behaves. Sometimes light behaves like a particle, like a piece of hail flying around. It's neither one. It's not a, wave, it's not a particle, it's light. But it does different kinds of things in different situations. But light is energy traveling through space. That's what's important for us. Let me ask you about light and your body. Your body's good at detecting light. So what part of your body is good at detecting what we call visible light? The red, the blue, the green. Your eyes are a good light detector. What part of your body is good at detecting infrared light? Skin. Why is your skin good at detecting infrared light? To protect itself. To protect itself? What in your skin? No, that's water. It's the water in your skin cells that's good at detecting infrared light. How about x-rays? <coughs> Bones are x-ray detectors. Your skin isn't, your muscle isn't. This is why x-rays can penetrate through the muscle or the skin, the blood, but it can't penetrate through the bone. So the bone absorbs the x-rays. It detects the x-rays. How about ultraviolet light? I heard this answer earlier. The skin, and I heard in detail why your skin does that. The melanin. Okay. The melanin molecules in your skin absorb the ultraviolet light. Astronomers have gotten very adept at inventing or using materials someone else invents that are good at detecting different kinds of light. When most of us think about light, we think about what our eyes can see, the red, the yellow, the blue, the green. But there are kinds of light. Infrared light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, they're all light. They're all energy traveling through space. The difference between an x-ray and infrared light is how much energy is carried by the x-ray and the size of the wave, the light wave. X-rays are very tiny, so they can penetrate easily. They also carry tremendous, amount of, tremendous amounts of energy. So whatever absorbs an x-ray absorbs lots of energy. If the wrong thing absorbs the x-ray, like a 
a DNA molecule, it can cause that molecule to change. So you want to avoid the x-rays because they can penetrate into your body and when they eventually get absorbed, they release lots of energy wherever they're absorbed. Visible light doesn't go through my skin. So no matter how much visible light there is here, I may get warm, okay, but the visible light can't get inside me. Astronomers use different kinds of light as tools to observe different kinds of objects. So maybe we can bring the lights down again for this slide. This is the Milky Way, the galaxy in which we live, seen in two different kinds of light. On your right, light, on your right, infrared light. In see if my pointer works here. Can you see that little red dot? No? Yes. I don't see red very well, so all right. Visible light. It looks dark. It's dark because there's dust in between the stars, which is blocking the light. It's not that the stars are we can't see them. When we look infrared, try my little light beam again, which I don't see at all, but we'll just pretend it's there somewhere. In infrared light, the dust glows, the dust is warm. And in infrared light, you don't see the stars as much as you see the dust. So in infrared light, we actually see that thin line going through the Milky Way, which is the signature of the dust. These are four different images of the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is the remnants of a star that exploded almost 1,000 years ago, a supernova explosion. When we look at x-rays, the object very different than when we look with other kinds of light. In x-rays, it looks like we see a swirling disk, and indeed we do. In the signature of electrons that are being accelerated by magnetic fields to incredibly high speeds, and then they give off light. We're seeing different physics, different phenomena, because we're looking at different kinds of light. We're seeing certain kinds of material that light. We're seeing some stuff that's hot and glowing. We're also seeing some reflected light. In infrared light, we're seeing warm stuff, not super hot stuff. Different kinds of light enable us to see different kinds of things. One kind of light is perhaps most confusing is radio. You say radio. What do you use to detect radio signals? An antenna. What do you use? When I say listen to the radio, what do you use? Your ear. What are you detecting with your ear? Sound. You're detecting a sound wave. You can't tune in right now with your ear to 97.1 FM. You need some kind of detector that can detect a radio wave, which is light. And that's an antenna, a piece of metal. And then you need a device that's able to translate the information that's contained in the radio wave into a sound wave and broadcast the sound wave so that you can hear it. A radio wave is light, just like x-rays, gamma rays, infrared, microwaves, visible light. They're all different kinds of light. So here's the sun. Interesting looking thing. We've got a band down here that says 5,000 kilometers. So this is a, a big thing we're looking at. This is the sun in yellow or orange light. Why do we see the sun as this color? That's the question in front of us, though you don't have to answer it this second. So here's the object. So you do have to answer these questions. Why is the grass green? It absorbs everything except good. Grass does not emit or give off green light. The light from the sun is all colors. And that light from the sun hits the blades of grass. And the grass, the material in the grass, absorbs the red and the blue and the yellow and the orange. But it doesn't absorb the green. And the green bounces off the grass. 
and we see reflected light when we see the grass is green. Why orange is orange? Same answer. The material that makes up the skin of the orange absorbs all the other colors of light but reflects orange. Orange bounces off the orange. The orange does not produce orange light. The grass doesn't produce green light and the blue man group, they don't emit blue light but the paint they put on their face absorbs all the other colors. Last one, so the light's down. <laughs> all right. We have some blue flame on the bottom right. Flame blue. The heat. They're, they're emitting light based on the temperature. That's the right answer. We had the blue man group. They're blue because they reflect blue light. We have the blue flame. It's blue because it emits blue light. They're very different kinds of objects. Stars are objects that emit light. They don't reflect light. So what we need to do is understand why the red coals are red, why the blue flame is blue, why the sun appears yellow or orange. These are objects that are emitting light. So now we can have the lights back up. This is a complicated plot. So we're going to work it over a bit. This is known as a black spectrum or a thermal spectrum. Okay? And you will have a quiz on this. <laughs> the vertical axis is marked as intensity. It measures how much energy you're getting. Forget about the lines on the plot right now. Just focus on the axes. The vertical axis measures how much light. The first tick mark is 10. The next tick mark is 2. It was 100. So each tech, tick mark is a factor of 10 brightness. So 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, up to 100 million. That's the vertical axis. The further the more light we get, the more energy we've got. Along the horizontal axis, it's marked as wavelength. It is marked as nanometers. That doesn't matter. To your right is ultraviolet light. To your left, infrared. In the middle, we have a visible spectrum to give you a starting point. The numbers along the horizontal axis don't matter. They refer to the wavelength of light. Going to the left are long wavelengths. Going to your left, short wavelengths beyond the ultraviolet rays and then gamma rays, beyond the infrared, you would get to millimeter waves and then radio waves. In the visible, you can see the spectrum to our pilot. Now we can look at the lines on the plot. We have four different lines on the plot. The top one is marked 15,000 K star. The K refers to kelvins. It's the way scientists measure temperature. We can just say degrees, 50,000 degrees. Below, we have a yellow line that's marked the sun, 5,800 kelvins. Below that, we have another curve marked 3,000 K star, 3,000 degrees star. And below that, we have this little one, 310 K human. You need to assume now that each of these curves is produced by something of the same size. All right? Remember we talked about the burners, the pot of spaghetti, how you're going to boil it, and we said temperature matters and size matters. I want to take size out of the discussion. I just want to compare objects with different temperatures. So let's assume we have four different objects with different temperatures, but the same sizes. All right? These curves compare the amount of kinds of light produced by these four different objects. Not reflected light. These are sources of light. They produce light, send it off into space. What we learn if we compare those four curves? Help me out. The hotter the, the blue. The hotter the bluer? What else? The amount of energy. What about the amount of energy? It's different. 
How is it different? If I compare the hot one to a cool one, how is the amount of energy different? The wavelengths appear different. What else? It emits more. It emits more. It's getting somewhere. All right. Let's compare the 15,000 degree star with the 3,000 degree star. If I pick any particular wavelength, so let me start down here, and I'm going to give up on this. Let's just go at 10 to the 2 at 100. And if we look where the 3,000 K star is, it actually comes down below the bottom of the plot before it gets to 10 to the 2. It's producing almost no. Now, this, this plot in principle goes down infinitely far into the basement. So eventually, that line would cross 10 to the 2. But it's producing almost no energy at that wavelength. The 15,000 lots of energy at that wavelength. So depending on the temperature, we get more or less energy from the object. The 15,000 kilometer at every single wavelength produces more energy at every wavelength. Start with 100, but you pick any number you want and the, the curve is always above the red curve, always. So a hotter object produces more energy at every wavelength, all right? Our 300 degree human, we're out here. We don't produce a lot of light. But in fact, I'm producing light. I'm emitting light, which I Certain kinds of detectors could detect my presence in this room, even if the lights are out. Infrared detectors would detect me. This is why Air Force pilots have the special goggles and devices. They can see mountains. They can see buildings. They can see people at night with the lights off because they're emitting light. They're emitting infrared. They produce most of their energy out here in the infrared. I'm not producing much visible light. I am producing some, but our eyes are not sensitive enough to detect the visible light my body's producing. I'm, in fact, x-rays. Now, I may only spit out one x-ray every thousand years, but if we wait long enough, I produce x-rays. So another feature of these black body curves is that objects that are emitting energy because of their temperature emit energy at every wavelength. Every object emits gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and radio waves. Higher objects emit more of everything. Objects emit less of everything. One more thing to pull from this curve. The gentleman back, I think, told us this. The hotter objects are bluer. Each of these curves has a break. For the human, this peak is in the infrared. For the 3,000 K star, the peak is actually still in the infrared, just a little bit beyond the red. For the sun, where's the peak? Yellow. The sun appears yellow-orange because the range of most of its light. The 15,000 K star has a peak over here in the ultraviolet. So now we have an incredibly powerful tool. If we understand these things called black bodies, and physicists figured out black bodies in the middle of the 19th century, black bodies are mythical laboratory objects that produce light at every wavelength, and the only thing that matters is their temperature. If I have a black box, almost like my briefcase here that's black. And if this were a true black body, I could shine anything on it, and it would absorb that light. It would absorb the x-rays. It would absorb the radio waves. It would absorb the visible light. It absorbs everything. And if you absorb light, you're absorbing energy. And if you absorb energy, you heat up. Now you have a temperature. And now that thing that has a temperature will give off light. And it will give off light in this way. And it turns out this is what stars look like. There are some differences depending on the star. But to a good approximation, 
Every star looks like this. Stars generate light. They emit light at every wavelength. And if you measure how much light the star emits in red, in blue, in green, in infrared, in radio, in ultraviolet, you can plot the amount of light they get at every wavelength, and you'll discover where the peak is. And if you discover where the peak is, you've now measured the temperature of the star. And that's pretty cool. Or hot. Okay. So this is what we get out from the black body spectra. They give off light at all wavelengths. The location of the peak tells us the temperature of the object giving off the light. And objects give off more light at every wavelength than cooler objects assuming they're the same size. So let's go back to the 1850s. There is an understanding of black bodies by about this time. And we know that stars have different temperatures. Or I'm sorry, stars have different intrinsic brightnesses. We know that the difference in brightnesses depends or could depend on, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Stars appear different in how bright they are. We know that they have intrinsically different brightnesses because we can have two stars that have different apparent brightnesses but are the same distance from us. So you know, they can be intrinsically different. We do know that the apparent brightnesses can depend on distances, but the intrinsic brightnesses depend on two other properties, their size and their temperatures. How bright they look will depend on three properties, their sizes, their temperatures, and how far away they are. So we have to figure out how to measure those three properties of stars. That's the goal now. If we can figure out how to measure the distances to stars, the temperatures of stars, the sizes of stars, we'll have gone a long way toward understanding stars. Now we did this last we did this parallax experiment. Put your finger in front of your eye and you blink your eyes and you can see that things move. Details here, this just explains what we did last time because we got a week ahead of ourselves. So what I want to do is ask, how am I going to use parallax? That's what I want to do. I want to measure distance using parallax. Okay. What we want to start with measure is figuring out how to measure relative distance, absolute distances. So let's go there. So you do this experiment and look at the people sitting in front of you and around the room. It will be the angle. Put this on my hip. That's better? Okay. Can you still hear me? All right. So when you look at an object blinking your eyes. Which objects appear to move more? The closer objects. So there's the relative measurement. Close objects have large parallaxes. Distant objects have smaller parallaxes. So we can measure relative distances. We can conclude that object is further away from me than this object. But I want to measure distances physical distances. I want to lay out a yardstick to the stars. Okay. All right. Now, I don't have a ball with you. You can do this at home, in the safety of your own home. Don't throw at your eyes. Okay. Try to catch a ball with one eye shut. Okay. Even harder, if you have good insurance, try to parallel park your car with one eye shut. Okay. You have a lot of years of experience driving and parking cars. You might actually succeed in doing it, but it's very hard to do. What you're doing with your two eyes is you're measuring constantly relative distances, and indeed your brain is able to figure out, at least to a good approximation, absolute distances so that you can parallel park that car. So what are we really doing when we measure parallax? And someone told me the answer a few moments ago. We're measuring angles. So this is a cartoon 
of our head. We have a left eye and a right eye, okay? Like this, okay? Left eye and a right eye. And there's some object in the distance. We look from our left eye, we look from our right eye, that object appears to be at a different position relative to where from, from those two starting positions. There are several things that we're really measuring. There's a, what we call the baseline, the distance between our eyes, whatever it is. Your brain knows what that distance is. What we really want to know is this thing I've called D, the distance to the object. Actually measuring is that angle at the top of our triangle. Because of symmetry, the angle at the bottom of the triangle on the left and on the right, those are identical angles. And if you remember your geometry, there are 180 degrees in a triangle. If you measure that angle at the top, the two angles at the bottom are each half of what's left. You now know the three angles in the triangle. Your brain knows the distance between your two eyes. If you know three angles in a triangle and you know one side, you can use geometry to calculate the length of the other two sides. This goes back two and a half thousand years. It's just geometry. So what your brain is doing constantly is measuring that angle. And because your brain knows the size of your head, it's able to measure distances. Now, with your it's hard to measure for stars. It's easy to measure the distance to the stop sign but not to stars. So with stars, we need different eyes. So what eyes should astronomers use in order to measure the distances to stars? What's that? Telescopes. telescopes. So where do you want to put your telescopes? Or with the Earth around the sun. Okay. Initially, we could measure by putting one telescope in Spain and one telescope in Germany. But what we now do is put the telescopes in orbit around the sun. Now the easiest way to put a telescope in orbit around the sun is, as was mentioned by somebody else, use time. Today the telescope is on one side of the sun, six months later the telescope's on the other side of the sun, just because the Earth carries it there. I think we did talk about this last time. So as the Earth orbits the sun, this is a, an artist's rendition of the Earth orbiting the sun. We have the Earth on each side of the sun. One star is closer than the other stars. So this is just like having two eyes and looking at an object and measuring those angles. And we measure the motion of that close star relative to the distant stars. In this left-hand panel, what we have, the big star is the close star, and it appears to move back and forth relative to distant stars. Every six months, it moves from one end to the other and back again. So we're measuring this angle. If we want to measure angles even more carefully, we'll put a telescope in orbit around Jupiter and let Jupiter carry the telescope around the sun. And then we've got an even bigger baseline for our triangle. And the big baseline is distant the objects are for which we can measure distances. So one goal from, for astronomers is to build telescopes that can span the length of the solar system so we can measure these distances. Uh, because even with the size of the Earth's orbit, we can only measure distances out to about 60 light years, which is our neighborhood. We want to be able to go further away than that, and that's a challenge. The first measurements of parallax were made in the 1830s. Friedrich Bessel measured the parallax of the star known as 61 Cygni in 1838. And then the day broke. And the next year, Thomas Henderson and Friedrich von Struve reported their own parallax measurements of Alpha Centauri and Vega, respectively. These turned out to be three of the closest stars. But suddenly, astronomers knew distances to stars at least these three stars. We didn't just know the star was further away. We had literally laid out a yardstick to measure the physical distance to these stars. And that's pretty neat. Because once you know the distances to the stars, and you know that those stars have different brightnesses, different colors, you can now try to figure out how to truly measure their temperatures and truly measure their sizes. 
end of the to about a dozen stars because most stars are far away and it's really tough to find close enough for which we could measure parallax in the 1970s. All right. Here we have our Big Dipper again, and this is just meant to be not literally correct. But let's imagine this top star is a distant star. A parallax to that star. With the lights on, we can barely see. Parallax, and therefore the distance to that star, it's a tiny little faint star. I now have very clear evidence that there's a lot more to this picture than where we started minutes ago, that it's not just distance. Because now I have the bright star, which is the distant star. If the bright star is the distant star, and now let's go further with this. Let's imagine that for both of those stars, I can measure light at lots of different wavelengths. And I discover that they're the same colors. They produce the same black body spectrum. The peak of the black body spectrum for both stars is yellow. What do I know about the two stars? Same temperature. I know their distances. I know their temperatures. If they're the same temperature, then if they're the same size, they produce the same amount of light. But the bright one is far away. So what do I know about the bright one? Size. And so what do I know about its size? It's big. Bingo. We can measure sizes. We can measure temperatures. We can measure distances. The key is measuring the distances to stars. Because no matter how far away the stars are, I can measure the colors. As long as the light gets away, I can measure the relative colors. Measuring the distances, that's the really hard thing. There we go. So this brings me to this diagram, which was where I wanted to get. This diagram. H stands for Hertzsprung. That's the name of somebody. R stands for Russell. That's the name for somebody else. And we'll encounter both of them, I hope. So let me back four centuries. In 1666, Isaac Newton the road toward the HR diagram, though he didn't know that that's what he was doing. He put light from the sun through a prism. When it goes through a prism, you get a spectrum. The light spreads out into the colors of the rainbow. Okay. You can also rainbow and put it through another prism and combine it and you get white light again. Light is composed of lots of different colors. You just need to know how to spread it out and make measurements of what you've got. This is a spectrum of the sun. John, could you flip the lights down since you just came in there? What we've done with the sun is the spectrum is so long that we've chopped it up in pieces and then stacked the pieces on top of each other. The top line will be the reddest part of the spectrum, and then you continue with the next line and the next and the next line to go from red over to the blue and the violet. What do you see when you look at the spectrum of the sun besides the colors? Gaps. Good. These gaps we refer to as dark lines by offer in the early 19th century when he actually measured 574 of those dark lines in the spectrum of the sun. He didn't understand what was causing those dark lines. He just thought the light was missing. But over the next several decades, chemists started to figure out why the light was missing. You can put different kinds of materials in the laboratory and shine light through those materials. So let's imagine I have a cloud of sodium gas, and I put it in a bottle, and I shine light through the sodium gas. Light goes into the sodium gas, I've got all the colors, and when the light comes out, there's some missing. The sodium has absorbed some of the colors. The sodium has removed some of the colors, in the same way that your bone absorbs x-rays, in the same way that the water in your skin absorb infrared light, now we're talking not about infrared light, but about a very, very precise slice out of the infrared, or a very 
slice out of the visible, very precise slice out of the yellow. And sodium will absorb different colors of light, will hydrogen, and will then carbon. Every element has a unique fingerprint of light. It's a these are spectra of different stars. Different. These are nice modern, actually synthetic to help illustrate what we're looking at. But from top to bottom, you could pick one line, let's say this one right in the middle, and you see that that line changes in how dark it is with the different stars. That line is telling us two things about the star. Partly it's telling us what the star is made of. Because if the star didn't have any hydrogen, it wouldn't absorb that color of light. The amount of hydrogen it has is also going to determine how dark that line is. There's another, several other factors, actually, one of which is the pressure, another of which is the temperature. If the hydrogen is at the wrong temperature, it won't absorb the light. If the hydrogen is at the right temperature, it will absorb the light. That's the chemistry and physics of those lines. These are actual spectra, although these are drawn. This is before photography was possible for astrophysical objects. In the 1860s, the Italian astronomer Angelo Secchi started observing the spectra of stars. It produced all the lines, but stars could be characterized based on these lines. We now know that the lines are telling us the same thing the black body spectrum is telling us. The lines are telling us the temperature as well as the chemistry of the star. But for him, they were just different stars. And he created what he called first type, second type, third type, and fourth type stars, categorized by the kind of lines they had. Prior to this, categorized as Alpha Orionis, Beta Orionis, Delta Orionis. And all that meant is Alpha Orionis is the brightest star in Orion. But we now know that the brightest star in Orion is bright either because it's close, or because it's big, or because it's hot. Tell us any actual properties of the star. Just tells us how it looks to us. These categories actually tell us something about the physical properties of the stars themselves. This was the beginning of what's called spectral classification of the star, and it's vitally important for modern At the end of the 19th century, astronomers really started being able to associate the lines with different kinds of materials. And it turns out that the most prominent in most stars are due to hydrogen. This is why we know that hydrogen makes up most and indeed in the universe. But there were lots of other kinds of elements that were identified. So now let's jump to Boston. Edward Pickering was the director of the Harvard College Observatory. And in the 1870s, a amateur astronomer in Boston how to use a photographic plate. My but no, but in the film actually on a piece of glass instead of filming your camera before digital cameras. Henry Draper figured out how to take a photographic plate, put in particular, was he put a prism in between the starlight and the photographic plate. So each star produced a speck instead of a little dot. So that picture on the top right is a picture of a few dozen stars. But what you see in the photographic image is the spectrum of the stars. And Henry Pickering picked up this technique and implemented it at the Harvard College Observatory. And it produced thousands and thousands of plates, an archive of photographic plates. Now what do you do? Well, you need someone to look at them. And he hired what he called computers to catalog them. Computers used to be people. Okay? And the idea of computers wasn't unique to the Harvard College Observatory. But his computers were a team of women. 
The women couldn't get any other jobs in astronomy, but he hired them as computers. Wrong way. The first computer he hired, Williamina Fleming, began as his housekeeper. He then hired her in 1881 to start computing, which meant looking at these spectra and classifying the spectra. Using the same general idea that Angela Setsi had used, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4. Williamina Fleming decided that the type, the four categories of Setsi weren't good enough. She decided she'd use a different categories, categories, different categories. Okay? <laughs> she had A stars and B stars and C stars all the way down to O, but they didn't fit in the the symmetry of things. The A stars were the ones that had the most hydrogen with the darkest hydrogen lines, those are the A stars. The ones with the next darkest hydrogen lines, those are the B stars. So she had 15 or so categories of stars. In a period of about a decade, she single-handedly categorized over 10,000 stars. It's a tremendous achievement. Picker published what was called the, the first Harvard catalog of uh, spectra in 1890. He was the sole author of the publication. He was very generous, though. He said in the beginning, the great portion of the measurement and classification of all the spectra and the preparation of the catalog for publication has been in charge of Mrs. Fleming. So she got a footnote. <laughs> He got credit. His deal was he was smart enough to hire her and put her to work to do this job, but she did all the work. What we now have is a three-dimensional classification scheme for We don't know what it means, except some stars have more hydrogen absorbing light than others, but it's a good starting place. One of the ideas at the time was that when stars are born, they're hot, and then they cool off. And the decision was made that A stars are the hottest stars, and as they cool off, they go to B and C and D and F, and eventually they end up as O stars when they die. Bunk. Okay. There was no rational basis for this idea, but for a decade or so, it was the going idea. Okay. Annie Jump Cannon was hired in 1893. Over the next 25 years or so, she single-handedly categorized over 200,000 stars. Okay. Yes? Based only on subjectivity on their eyes? Yes. This was looking at In modern times, we can quantify this. But at this time, no. It was just subjective. So I jump and decided that the categories set up by Williamina Fleming were redundant. He decided to reorder the stars and eliminate some of these redundancies and focused on just these categories. B, A, F, C, and stars. Fractional stars. You can A2 stars and A5 stars and A8 stars. A1, A2, A3, A4, up to 9, and then you go to the next category. This was adopted for use in 1910, it's still what we use. And with this arrangement, when you go from O to B to A to F to K to K, you are going from hot stars to cool stars. And this is a 1901 spectral sequence of real stars and the different lines she was using. This was the basis for Annie Jump Cannon's work in now assigning categories to stars. So here are the categories. And astronomers of my generation were taught to remember the order. They run in temperature from K degrees to O stars, which are 50,000 degrees. Up to L and T up here, this is a footnote because about 10 years ago, astronomers decided we needed two other classifications. There were two letters left, L and T. The person who figured out that we needed the classification, turns out the very cool stars and brown dwarfs is a fellow. So that's really cool. All right. Okay. This is 
Some other ways you might decide to remember this mnemonic if you want. Uh, you can take your pick. Remember from backward. Um, my killer goat farted after breakfast oatmeal. That'll keep you awake in the morning. All right. But astronomers have to remember the order of the letters because it's vitally important for what we do. Okay. Now, in 1900, there were about 20 letters, as I mentioned, that had parallaxes. Some of these parallaxes, not this guy, though. This is Hertz. <coughs> he actually figured out that some stars truly are bigger than other stars. He discovered that there were some faint red stars and some bright red stars distant. And that absolutely means that this was the first real proof that stars and other stars are little stars. Started measuring parallaxes for other stars. And by 1910, he measured parallaxes for all of 52 stars. But this had increased known parallaxes by more than of two. And he produced this chart. This is the first. In this plot, we have bright stars at the top, faint stars at the bottom. We have red stars to the right, blue stars to the left. You can use any Cannon's classification star to decide where you put stars going right to left, because those classifications measure the temperature of the stars. Once you know the distances of stars, and you know their temperatures, you can measure their size. But more importantly, with their distances and how bright they appear to be, you can measure their true brightnesses. And that gives you with It turns out that most stars fall along this line, marked by those two straight lines. Astronomers call that the main sequence. That's where most stars live out their lifetimes. A few stars in the top right and a few stars in the bottom left. I want to put this on the HR diagram. We have brightness on the vertical axis, temperature on the horizontal axis. Generally speaking, we have a We have faint, hot stars down here. We have bright, cool stars on the top right. The ones on the top right are going to be our red giants. The one on the bottom left, those are going to be our white dwarfs. All right, so let's compare these two stars. Stars A and B have the same temperature. One is bright, one is faint. What can you conclude about A compared to B? Size, which one's B? A. A and C are the same brightness, but A is hotter than C. Which one? C. A is hotter, but they produce the same amount of light. A hotter thing doesn't need to be to produce the same amount of light. The cooler thing has to be much bigger to produce the same amount of light. Now I have C both the same temperature, they're both cool. C is bright, D is faint. So which one's bigger? C. C is bigger than D. So I have my top line, I have hot, bright, big stars. Bottom left, I have hot, super small stars. Bottom right, small stars, hot, bright, cool, bright, super big stars. Stars get bigger as you go upwards and to the right. Smaller as you go downwards to the left. If I can measure the true brightness of a star and the true temperature of a star, I can put it on this diagram. This diagram is, as this diagram takes us to the edge of the universe and to the beginning of time in the universe. We need this diagram. It's all is in here. This is a cartoon diagram with spectral types along the bottom, the brightnesses of stars. First, again, we have the white dwarfs down here. We have the red giants right. 90% of all stars live on the main sequence. What we have to do is figure out why stars do that. Why some stars are big, why some stars are small, why most stars are on the main sequence. What makes it tick? Once we can do that, and we'll do a little bit of that next time, we can try to figure out an age of the universe. 
So the first ones we're going to use to do that are the white dwarfs. So next week we're going to talk exclusively about white dwarfs and how they work and how from white dwarfs and this plot we're going to get an age for the universe. And I'll see you next week. And I think there are a few... Thanks. If you want to read more, I think the bookstore people are supposed to be outside again because they ran out last week. We'll see you next week.